In the early morning of September 15, 1990, residents of a quiet mobile home neighborhood in Duval County, Florida, stumbled upon a suspicious scene. The screen on one of their neighbor's windows had been fully removed, and the door was propped open. This is where they discovered 59-year-old Alice Vest, face down, draped over the edge of her bed, bloodied and beaten. According to the medical examiner, she had been stabbed multiple times with a knife and a pair of scissors, as well as beaten with various objects like a broken bottle and a metal bar, before being strangled to death with a phone cord. This small, mobile home neighborhood was pretty tight-knit, and most knew who Alice was. Just the night before, Alice had gone out for dinner with a friend, Linda Engler, arriving home late at around 11.30pm. This was the last person to see Alice alive. Now, this made the case quite difficult. No eyewitnesses to the crime, no confession, no motive. DNA analysis was still pretty shaky at the time, and the weapons that were left at the scene of the crime had no fingerprints. It seemed like there was nothing to go off of. However, the killer did leave behind one clue. Something that they could never even know they left. A single strand of hair found on Alice's blouse. Now, hair is everywhere, from long flowing locks to wiry facial hair, even barely visible peach fuzz. Hair covers almost all of our bodies. And what's more, it's constantly shedding. The average human head alone sheds upwards of 100 hairs a day. So it's no wonder why hair has been used as evidence in crime investigations. With the help of a state police analyst testimony that hairs in Sullivan's pocket were consistent with the victims. After all, no criminal could pick up every strand of hair they leave behind. The very first reported usage of hair in a murder case in the United States dates all the way back to 1855, where John Browning and his son were both tried for the murder of a plantation manager in the Mississippi Delta. After searching their home, police found a noose with drops of blood as well as a few strands of hair, hair that matched that of the victim. However, at the time, this was deemed inconclusive, and the Brownings got off scot-free. But that was over a century ago. And since then, the science around hair analysis has evolved quite a bit. In the late 1970s, the FBI published the 53-page Microscopy of Hairs, Practical Guide and Manual. In this manual, they detailed the microscopic characteristics of hairs that could be used to determine where and who they came from. Details that were way too small for the naked eye but easily identifiable under extreme magnification. FBI agents were trained to notice these details, from pigment distribution to the overall structure of a strand of hair. This was a near miracle for criminal investigations. Now, back to the Alice Vest case. Despite having this hair, there was still one problem there was no one to match it to. So the police started looking, asking residents about suspicious characters in the area recently. I mean, sure, it was a long shot, but it would narrow down the suspects considerably. And with nothing else to go off of, they had to try. But eventually, the police received an anonymous phone call from a man who had reportedly been driving by the area on his motorcycle the very same morning of the crime. He mentioned seeing a distinct car, a Ford Ranchero, sitting outside of the mobile home. A car that wasn't there when Alice's body was found. They had a lead. After that, it wasn't too hard to follow the tracks. The same car, one that matched the physical description given by the motorist, was found abandoned behind a used car dealership, with only one home in the near vicinity the home of one Stephen Richard Taylor. Now, Taylor claimed he had an alibi, 
Him and his friends Gerard Delay Murray and James Fisher were reportedly together the night of the crime, drinking and playing pool at a local bar before Fisher dropped them both off and headed home on his own. All three men gave the exact same story and there was nothing else tying them to the scene of the crime. But the police were desperate and had nothing else to go off of. So they took hair samples from each and sent them along with the hair found at the scene of the crime to an FBI lab in Washington, D.C. And they found a match. Taylor and Fisher could not be tied directly to the crime at this time. But Murray was a different story. According to the FBI report, the hair found on Alice's blouse matched perfectly to Murray's pubic hair. The evidence was damning. Their alibi fell apart and Murray and his friends were sent to prison. Caught because of one strand of hair. And this isn't the only case of this happening. Chicago, 1978. Dennis Williams was found guilty of the abduction and murder of both Lawrence Leinberg and Carol Schmall. Hair found in the trunk of his car matched that of the victims to a T. Louisiana, 1981. Clyde Charles was found with the hair of a Caucasian woman on his coat collar, hair that matched on a microscopic level to the victim in a recent murder. Oklahoma, 1988. Ron Williamson and Dennis Fritz were convicted of the murder of Deborah Sue Carter after 17 hairs were found at the scene of the crime, all of which matched Williamson and Fritz. Now, these cases all have two things in common. First, microscopic hair analysis was used as damning evidence in court, tying each suspect directly to the victims and the crime scene. And second, every one of these individuals were innocent. Hair analysis falls under the umbrella of other pattern-matching disciplines in forensic science. The best-known example is fingerprints. But this includes plenty of other practices, like shoe prints, handwriting, tire treads, bite marks, bullet casings. Now, these are referred to as forensic science, but that isn't quite accurate. These methods were developed independently of what many would consider part of the science world. For example, when looking for a reliable source, you might check to see where it was studied what grant funded it, what university it came from, whether or not it's peer-reviewed. Only a select few of these forensic sciences were subject to this scrutiny. The rest just accepted as truth, developed in response to specific crime scenes, situations where other evidence and information wasn't conclusive. These assessments are purely subjective. Remember that FBI manual mentioned earlier? It did say that hair analysis was accurate and a trained professional could match strands of hair to an individual person. But what the manual failed to mention was the fact that different people can have the same hair, even down to a microscopic level. But the damage was done. Hair microscopy became instrumental in more than 20,000 cases before the year 2000 and led to countless, likely wrongful, convictions. Murray is still in prison to this day, but much of the evidence against him has all but crumbled. Blood and seminal fluids that were found at the scene of the crime did not match any of Murray's samples, and Right now, the only thing keeping him behind bars is the very same thing that put him there. A single strand of hair. 